Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the SICE Young Members Panel Roadshow for Student Chapters. Thank you all of our students for taking, out of, taking time out of their busy schedules to be here today. Um, we have had some changes to the program that was sent out and advertised. Up first, we will have Priscilla, who has kindly replaced Michael at very short notice. She will be giving us a brief history and introduction to SICE. Following this, we will have Maxine Jacob, who will give us a presentation on how you can further your education after graduation. Nadira Bellum will give us an overview of her early career experience since she has graduated from UKZN. We also have Erin De Silva and Innocentia Mashlangu, who represent the SICE Transport and SICE PMCD divisions. They will provide us with some background on their divisions and the type of work they are involved in. Lastly, we have Mr. Jacques Struta, who will present on his experience in registering with EXA as a professional engineer. We also have some time at the end of the program for any questions you may wish to ask the presenters. The Blackboard chat room is open for you to type out any of your questions. This is located at the far right hand corner. Um, I, it would be advisable if you don't raise your hands, I've been told. Um, Priscilla, do you want to take over and start? Um, yes, I am ready. Thank you, Jimin. Um, welcome, students. Um, so Jimin did explain that everyone, there will be a Q&A session. So if you have questions throughout our speakers, please jot them down and then we will attend to them at the end of the session. So I will start sharing my screen um, to introduce students to uh, SICE, what is SICE and why SICE. So um, the good thing about COVID is now we can do things nationally. Um, at the end of this presentation, I will share some few pictures that I've included um, that the young members have organized before. Um, so my name is Priscilla Monye. Um, my highest degree in civil engineering is Master of Engineering uh, focusing on soil mechanics. So I'm part of the SICE Ethics Committee, and then I did also serve the Bloemfontein Civil Engineering Community from 2018 until 2020. And then I've been part of the SICE Young Members Panel National since 2018 to date. And I think until um, the calendar kicks me out to be called a young member, which is very soon. Um, I do have 12 years industry experience, consulting engineering, um, structural and geotech um, designs and then municipality project management and then in construction um, mainly roads um, and water and now I have joined the academia lecturing um, any subject that I'm given so if you um, ask me where I want to be where the Lord sent me because I've been you know hopping around um, so the mission statement of the South African Institution of Civil Engineering is to advance the professional knowledge and improve the practice of civil engineering. So since 1953 and continuously rebranding itself according to um, according to times that we are in. So now the SICE is growing SICE. So the youth uh, voice is needed more than ever um, as our um, young members chairperson would, would say uh, the young members are the custodians of civil engineering. So being part of SICE is that you get to network with um, uh, civil engineers and then you get to get the uh, magazines um, that also gives the experience from other engineers and then all the specifications and the design manuals that we use um, and giving um, advice on what we can do. So before COVID hit, um, hit we, the student chapters would go and recruit students to be part of SICE as student, as students. So the students don't pay as long as you have proof of um, registration, you submit it to SICE and then uh, you don't have to pay your membership and then you get to receive the SICE uh, magazine. And also now that we're doing things online, you get to get the adverts, um, that SICE that we have over here. So SICE also strive to be a learned society for all those associated with it. So 
technologists, technicians, engineers um, are part of uh, SAIC. And then to cater for the interest and needs for uh, members. So it's for individual members. And when you, because we're talking to students now, um, so what you can do at the end of the session, you can just go into the SAIC website, or maybe we'll attend to some of the questions and then we'll guide on how to join as a student. Um, also to encourage the members to strive for excellence in civil engineering. Uh, this is SAIC branches throughout the country. Um, so now that we're doing things online, you might not be on campus, but uh, for now we're doing everything online. So you get to know what other branches uh, do. So this is how it works. As a student member, you will get, it's it's not a yes free size membership. As long as you're a student, you have updated um, proof of registration, you will be a student member. And then we have the student chapters. So uh, before COVID, it would be that student chapters will recruit students and then it will have first years until uh, the last year, depending on what institution you belong to. And then we have regional um, young members panel, which is part of the local branch. And then they will also be for more, um, form part of the uh, SAIC National YMP. So the, the young members panel is the young uh, professionals, those that are already in the industry. And then we all get to report to SAIC National in mid-range um, housing. So these are the divisions in SAIC. So once you are an associate uh, member, so there are different categories. You start as being a student, and then um, there is a non-corporate members, which is the associate members. Now you have graduated. Um, it's over five years, and then um, it goes to being a fellow, and then honorary uh, fellows as you advance in um, the industry. So those are the divisions within within SAIC. I think Maxine is going to go through on what you can study and you can be an expert in there. And then what is now new, as I've mentioned, that SAIC continue to rebrand itself. We have um, the new... Uh, oh, the other important thing to be part of SAIC is that uh, after you graduate, we do continue to attend course. Um, different courses and then you get to get discount if you're a SAIC member and then you get to form part of two divisions without paying and then the third one you'll pay. Uh, but there's this one, the geotechnical division, you it doesn't matter how many divisions you form part of, you pay because a geotech division forms part of the South African geologist and then other geology um, membership so we pay so that we form other uh, part of those um, voluntary associations. So SAIC is a voluntary association and then at the end of I think the last speaker will talk about EXA. So this is how the wheel looks. It's SAIC and the branches and then we have the young members. We, we welcome to um, also advise the student chapters and then also the young members in the industry if there's anything that SAICI can do for them. Um, so that is how it, it goes. And then this is our national panel 2021. Um, uh, Michael, I'm not sure if he will be able to join in, but it's Michael, our chairperson, and then we have Tsebo Kwena as our um, um, what do we call them? Chairperson-elect, I think we, we still use that um, in, uh, on the YMP. So the student chapters, these are the universities that are active in terms of student chapters. So I'm not sure how the student chapter communicate with, communicate with uh, students, but I want to think there's a way that um, they communicate even if some of you are back on campus and some are not. 
so these are the young members past events. Um, this is the key one that we had in 2018. Uh, the young members were addressed by the Chief Justice Mohoi We were um, so the whole theme was about ethics. Um, of course, now Saisi wants to focus on ethics, um, introducing young members to um, ethics. So please look out for the for the young members pages where we advertise all our events and RSVP if you need to, so that so that the the, the students know um, what is happening in the industry, you know, you get to know what is happening in the industry before you get there. Um, sorry about that. Um, so there's this say that I love very much, if God did not build it, I would say civil engineering practitioner, um, pr practitioners did it. Um, so guys, if you have any questions, please put them down and then we'll attend to them at the end of uh, the session. I just wanted to go through it so that we keep to our time and have enough time to for for Q&A session. Thank you so much, Timen. Thank you, Priscilla. That was very informative. I really enjoyed this section, especially about the different student chapters as well as the different branches and divisions. Up next, we have Maxine. Jimen, are you there? Should uh, Maxine, because I'm not sure what is happening. Hi, Priscilla. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Jimen. Not sure with Priscilla's connection. OK. Priscilla, please, can you mute yourself? Okay, guys, up next, we do have Maxine. Maxine graduated from UKZN in 2016, where she then began working at Transnet as a structural and marine engineer. I think she's ideally placed to present on how we can further educate ourselves after graduation. Over to yourself, Maxine. Uh, thank you so much for that, Jamin. Let me just share my presentation quickly. I'm not sure what is happening. So sorry, my internet is a little bit slow, but I hope you will be able to see it in a minute. Okay, can you all, I hope you can all see the presentation now. Uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Jumian. As you have said, I qualified with my BSc from UKZN in 2016, and I've worked at Transnet ever since. This means that I have just over four years of design experience in the field of port and coastal engineering and also some structural experience. And also what makes me a little bit well equipped to actually present this is that I've actually just recently completed my MBA. So I think that me talking to you on furthering your education is actually quite fitting. <laughs> So I would like to start by sharing this quote by Brian Herbert, which says, the capacity to learn is a gift, the ability to learn is a skill, and the willingness to learn is a choice. I think that the fact that you are all here on a Friday afternoon actually shows your willingness to learn, so well done for that. Once you complete your undergrad, it can actually be quite difficult to know exactly what you are doing and where you are going straight away. Some of you may have bursary commitments, which makes your decision a little bit easier, but for most people, it is really not such a straightforward decision. So if you are considering studying further, there's a few reasons that you could actually consider this. Um, if you're anything like me, then by the time you have submitted your final design project, you hope that you never see another lecture room for the rest of your life but you will somehow find yourself back there anyway. So some of the reasons that people choose to study further is that you will have an extreme thirst for knowledge. You will hope to expand or improve your job prospects, especially if you don't have a job lined up. 
The other reason is that you may not be ready to enter the workplace. Maybe you really enjoy campus life, but with COVID-19, I'm really not sure if there is much of a college life anymore. And like I said, if you can't find the job, then studying further is one of the best things you can do for yourself. And then if that doesn't pan out, then you can even pursue a career in academia like Priscilla has now done. So some of the factors that you should consider when furthering your ed education is that you first need to decide whether you are going to study full time, part time or go the distance learning route. Now, each of these have their merits. For example, uh, when, if you study full time, it means that you will focus entirely on your studying as you would probably do as an undergrad student, which leaves some flexibility in your personal life. If you study part time, it means that you can both work and study at the same time. However, in this case, you need a lot of commitment and you need to realize that the whole work life balance does not exist for this time. Uh, and then with distance learning, it means that there are not so many formal lectures and then your learning is your learning and you will be responsible for this. If you cannot commit to a full time uh, qualification, there are all always short courses that are available so that you can upskill yourself. Um, there are options like, well, the SICE short courses that they offer, and then online things such as Coursera and Udemy that offer relatively cheap uh, online courses. When looking into your research field, you need to also consider what it is that you are passionate about. What, how is this going to benefit you career-wise? How are you hoping to specialize? And also, how are you able to contribute to the industry as a whole? So the beauty of being an engineer is that you will generally have a strong foundation of math and science, which will hopefully open many doors for you. Uh, the math modules that almost killed most of us is the reason that many engineers are then headhunted by financial institutions to leave engineering and join them instead. The same applies to studying. The world is your oyster. If you study at university and come out with an honors degree, there are many postgraduate uh, opportunities for you. You can go the postgrad diploma route. You can go straight into a master's and then eventually go uh, and do your PhD. So in terms of the university study options, there are postgrad, postgraduate diplomas, such as a postgrad diploma in engineering or project management or business management. It really it depends on what your interests or your work requires. And these will usually require 120 credits of coursework and will usually be a one year course. For uh, MSc or Master of Science in Engineering, these tend to be more research orientated and these will have usually either 60 credits of coursework and 120 credit thesis or an entire 180 credit thesis where you will focus entirely on research. There's also an MEng, which is usually more technical and allows you to specialize in a branch of civil engineering. For example, to specialize in port and coastal engineering. For this, it's quite a bit more um, coursework and then usually a 60 credit research project or money dissertation. You can also then look at an MBA the way I did if you are hoping to expand your horizons and then eventually go on to a PhD. For a university of technology, the options are actually quite similar. However, the route is not necessarily the same. So if you start with a diploma, you then move on to your BTEC, your MTEC and your DTEC. And I believe that these are now being phased out. So more people are now doing a BNG tech which you can then do your honors and then go straight into an MEng and then a DEng or PhD. So these are similarly to the university study options. Your MTech and DTech have a research and thesis focus. They are either course based and include a research paper. And it is important to note that the national diploma is being phased out. And then for an image, like I mentioned before, there are full research options or partial research and which then also includes coursework. So then comes the question, where can you study? Now in South Africa, we are actually blessed that we have so many tertiary institutions and universities. Um, you, in just about every province, we have universities. So it doesn't really matter where you are based, you are able to study. 
especially now with an increased reliance on technology and more uh, universities offering online uh, courses. We also have our traditional universities like UKZN, UCT, and VIT, and then the universities of technology like DUT and CPUT. And then there are also private institutions like Mancosa or Regent Business College. If you don't want to stay in South Africa, especially after last week's riots, then there are also the options to pursue a career overseas or rather study overseas. Uh, we have these opportunities at, at the famous MIT or Caltech, which we all know about from watching Big Bang Theory. Again, there are options to complete international courses online. And many affluent countries offer bursary students to South Africans to complete either short courses or full master's degrees in an, in an att attempt to uplift third world countries like South Africa. So if you can, please leverage off these opportunities for yourself. When deciding when to study, you need to consider various things. As a postgrad student, you will have more choices than you did as an undergrad. Often as an undergrad, your parents or your location would have decided where you would study initially. But if you further your education, you are essentially doing it for yourself. When deciding where to study, you need to consider the reputation of the institution and the research whether, and research whether their qualifications are widely recognized. Affordability is obviously a major factor in this. A desire to travel may lead you to study abroad, but you should also consider the level of difficulty of some courses and realize that you need to be really motivated to continue your education regardless of where you continue it. You really need to have a thirst for knowledge to drive you to study further because it is really not an easy, uh, an easy choice, especially after studying your, uh, your undergrad. It comes with quite the adjustment, especially if you decide to work full time and then study part time. So just as a general guide for how you would go about going forward is that you would first need to do extensive research. Google different universities, um, speak to your peers, ask your lecturers, and like a session like this, consult with the industry experts. Once you have made a decision, apply on the university website. Compile all the documents that are required, such as your academic transcripts, your motivation letter, letters, etc. And please make sure that you submit everything well before the deadline. Then you need to think about funding. Usually, if you are lucky, your parents or you would have gotten a bursary for your undergrad. For postgrad, it is not always that straightforward. If you choose to pay for it for yourself, make sure that you are putting money aside each month if you can. You can also then apply for local or international scholarships and try to keep your marks up as these, are, these tend to be quite competitive. So I've compiled a list of pros and cons because like with everything in life, there are pros and cons that need to be weighed. So I'll start with the pros. Um, studying further can firstly, hopefully expand your job prospects and career paths and your employability, especially if you don't have a job. The problem arises if you become overqualified without much experience in the field, and then you become hard to employ because companies would rather employ a junior staff that they would have to pay less than someone that has a master's. Also realize that experience is one of the greatest teachers. So don't think that if you have a master's, you will automatically know more than someone with 30 years of experience who may have fewer qualifications than you. Be able to hold your own, but don't become arrogant in the process. For me personally, my MBA does not mean that I'm getting paid any more than I did as a junior engineer. I did it for myself in the hopes that it will one day benefit me later on in my career. There is therefore the increase in earning potential and you will also gain insight and knowledge into your respective field. The cons are obviously the cost. It's also the time taken and the extensive commitment that is required. There's definitely an increase in workload. So if you value sleep, it may not be for you. Finally, the level of difficulty. Postgrad studies are intense and a lot more specialized than your undergrad. So just to round up, I, because I think my time is almost up, I'm just going to leave you with a few tips. Weigh your options. Conduct a multi-criteria analysis for your life and decide what is important for you. Think about what you want to achieve for yourself 
and how you want to achieve this. Create your own list of pros and cons. Speak to as many people as you can. And if you decide to, full to study full time, treat this as your job. Whether you study further formally or not, continue, continuously strive to improve yourself. They say that the hustle starts now in your 20s so that you can have the life you've dreamed of in your 40s. There are no shortcuts or get rich quick, quick, sorry, get rich quick schemes. So put your head down and work hard now because the education is the one thing that cannot be taken from you. Thank you. Thanks, Maxine. I thought that was a great slideshow, especially the sections where you broke down the different types of postgrad degrees you can get. You can stay in engineering, you can stay, you can go towards project management, and you can also do business school like an MBA. So thanks for that. Up next, we have Nadira Bellum. Nadira graduated from UKZN in 2017, come Lauder. She then began working at JG Africa's Peter Matsburg office as a water engineer. In 2020, Nadira was also named as the inaugural SICE National Graduate Engineer of the Year. So over to you, Nadira. Okay, hey, hello everyone. I hope you guys are all well. I'm quite cold in this end of the world, so I hope you're all keeping quite warm. Can you see my screen, Jimin? Yes, we can see it, Nads. Okay, perfect. So just to begin, I actually um, considered doing my master's straight out of university and decided to actually stay and um, just dive into my actual career. Um, and I dived into consulting engineering and I stay there and I've only now decided to actually go back and do my master's part time. So it was a really useful Maxine and honestly I think if I had received one of those presentations when I was a student I might have actually stayed and done my master's. Okay so what I'm going to chat to you guys a bit about today is some of the early career experiences I had and some of the lessons that I had as a graduate. So for those of you who don't know, my name is Nadia Balam, and I'll tell you a little bit more about me as I carry on. Some of these lessons that I'm going to tell you about are from myself and some are from just other graduates that I've chatted to, but I just wanted to give you guys a bit of an insight of what it's like when you enter the working world. So today what we're going to do is we're going to chat just a little bit about transitioning from a student to an employee, the different career paths that you can look at, namely going into the public sector, um, and then going into the private sector as a contractor or a consultant. And then just a little bit about some of my experience. I'm going to tell you guys some hard truths and hopefully not traumatize you. And then give you guys a bit of the lessons that I've learned and some of the advice that I would have for you. Okay, so just a little bit about me. I matriculated from Peter Mansburg Girls High School in 2014. And I went into UKZN. My UKZN choice was just a pure fact that it was near me. Um, and I graduated from UKZN with a BSc in Civil Engineering in 2017. For my final year of my studies, I had a bursary from JG Africa. So I joined them as a graduate engineer in 2018, and I've been there ever since. In 2019, I really just wanted to expand my network and get to know a few more people around me. So I joined the SICE Peter Masberg branch, and I am currently part of the, the vice chair of the committee there. And yeah, I was super honored to be SICE's Graduate Engineer of the Year. And in 2021, I am still on the current adventure and currently doing my master's as well. So just to start off, transitioning from a student to an employee. Making this change from the student life to the working life is not always an easy one. And it can be quite overwhelming. So the first thing I wanted to say is if you are struggling, reach out to someone because I'm sure someone can actually help you. You need to find your own balance in your chosen career path. And balance is very different for everyone. I know everyone speaks about a work-life balance, but what might be my work-life balance won't necessarily work for Jimin, for example. Oh, sorry, I skipped over a slide there. OK, so let's just chat about the career paths you can follow. And there are three main career paths that you can look at. The first would be to enter the public sector. And here you're looking at your state-owned enterprises and your local and district government. Then you're even moving into being a civil engineering contractor or civil engineering consultant. Now, I'm a civil engineering consultant. So some of the input that I give you is more from a civil engineering consult consultant's point of view. So. Um, I'm sure people who are in contracting or working in the public sector will have a slightly different opinion and slightly different overview. 
So before I dive into the different career paths, I just want to tell all of you guys, this is something that I always encourage everyone to remember. And that is that engineering is a pathway that one takes to better the lives of those around them. So always keep that in mind. When you're feeling down and out sometimes, you are there to better the lives of those around you, and you are making a very positive impact on them. So every project you do is for people. And that, at the end of the day, is one of the most important things that you can use to just power through if you're feeling a little bit down. Okay, so first things first, the first career path you can enter is entering the public sector. So here we're looking at your state-owned enterprises, we're looking at your local and district governments, such as your municipalities. Here you generally aid in the creation and the implementation of public infrastructure. You will generally enter a project management role and you oversee engineering projects. You're not always directly involved in the design of them, but you do oversee the design of them. And you are generally involved in the development of policies and standards for the public. Generally, um, most municipalities, for example, offer in-service training as well as internships. And the internships tend to be quite well structured. And I know I've seen internships that are ranging from one year to two years right up to three years. Okay, so your next possible career path is actually being a civil engineering contractor. So quite simply, a contractor builds what was designed. So as a contractor, you'd undertake the maintenance, construction, and supervision of engineering designs to ensure that you are getting the best quality end product. This is generally quite a project management intensive role because you will be organizing and optimizing all your human and material resources to ensure that you are efficiently implementing the engineering design. If you are a complete fan of the outdoors, this is definitely for you because it's generally an outdoor, quite a hands-on approach, and it can sometimes be quite demanding. But I would think the job satisfaction is absolutely amazing because you actually get to see the products of your efforts. And the last career path, which is the career path that I'm actually in, is a civil engineering consultant. So a consultant would undertake the design and development of the most suitable engineering solution to a problem. Generally, you are mostly office-based, but you do go out for site visits where required. And just consulting engineering firms range in size, and they can focus on many different sectors. I think we are, as JG Africa, uh, are actually medium-sized firms, but you do definitely get firms that are large, and you get firms that are international and have a base in South Africa, and you get very small firms, which is literally just five or six people. Most of these firms generally have incoming graduate engineer programs, and they do offer in-service training. Once you're in consulting engineering, you generally either follow three pathways. You go the technical route, and you maintain your design capabilities, or you go into the management route, or you go into the business development route, or you do a combination of them. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to give you some of the personal experiences I've had as a civil engineering consultant, and then hopefully get through to some of the lessons learned. I know I'm running a bit on my time. Before I dive into the hard truths, I just want to say I don't want to traumatize you guys. What I'm telling you is just some of the things that I wish I knew when I entered. So the first things first is that you will not necessarily go straight into designing the next award-winning skyscraper or massive bridge. Generally, when you enter the working world, you start smaller, and you might just start with some basic drawing and basic engineering design, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. When you start smaller, you actually build up slowly into um, more and more complex designs. The next thing is that time management is essential and it goes hand in hand with stress management and I'm sure you know that from getting your degrees or diplomas time management is important but it just becomes even more important when you enter the working world. The next thing is a hard truth that is quite sad sometimes but the job market is very tough. You may struggle to find a job or you may not find a job in the field you prefer. You might love structures but you might end up in the water department. And the next thing is that getting your degree or diploma is literally just the start of the learning adventure. I have learned so much over the past three years, and it's what, quite the iceberg illusion, and I'll go back to the iceberg illusion in a few slides, but you think that you have all the cement knowledge, and when you enter the world, you're actually like, whoa, I have so much more that I have to learn. Okay. And then just the last two things that I wanted to chat to you guys about is that there is quite a difference between working in a smaller firm and a larger firm. My firm is actually medium in size. Generally, with the very large firms, they have a wide range of disciplines. So they offer structural
Guys, I think Nadia has just lost connection. Let's just give her a few minutes to see if she comes back online. Sorry about that, everyone. I think my internet is feeling as cold as I am. Jimin, can you hear me? Yep, we just waited for you. No problem. OK, so smaller firms generally don't have the same kind of manpower as the larger firms. So you will have to do many more of the engineering roles required. It becomes a little more difficult to specialize in one field, but you do get a nice broad range of experience. So the firm that you end up in, um, and whether you prefer smaller firms or large firms, honestly, it changes throughout people's careers. I'm sure there are many people that have switched between smaller and larger firms. OK, the next thing is actually the fact that time is money. Now, this is the biggest thing that I think you have to learn when you move into the working world. Your time is worth money, literally. Your clients pay you to do certain tasks with certain time frames, and your company pays you to do certain tasks with certain time frames. So it's very different to being a student where you are in control of whether you choose to laze around or do an all-nighter. Here, you have to do consistent, constant work. So. I think that is, for me, one of the biggest learning curves from university. And it's just ensuring that you're working consistently rather than those night before spurts. I mean, you might still have to do night before spurts, but it's different because you will be working a whole day most likely as well. So hopefully I did not traumatize you guys with those hard truths. Um, but I just wanted to let you guys all know that success is an iceberg. So you see everybody and you see the success, but what you're seeing is just the tip of the iceberg and you don't actually see the dedication and the hard work and the good habits that everybody has to put in so please keep putting in that persistence and that sacrifice and there might be a bit of failure and there might be a bit of disappointment but you put it all in yourself and i'm sure you will see the success so just some of the lessons that i've learned um the first is don't be afraid to ask questions Recently, I had a chat to a supplier of some valves, and he told me that he has no idea why graduates don't ask him more questions. Because in the four years degrees that we do, we never learn about things like valves. But when you get actually design a water system, it's one of the most important things you have to have. So ask a question. It is far, far better for you to risk a stupid question than to risk a life. Because at the end of the day, you are designing for people. And if something goes wrong, then it is a life that you are putting at risk. So ask those questions. There really are no stupid questions. Just ask. The next thing is that you might do everything you learn in university. Remember, university has to prepare you for such a broad range of possibilities of employment. So you might just not use everything that you learn in university, but you need to keep being willing to learn and keep growing. The next thing is might be quite obvious, but if you're stuck, Google it. Um, there's been so many times where I don't remember what I did in university, and I Google it, and it tends to just jog a memory, and I end up finding what I need. So if you're stuck, Google it. The next thing is to please put in the effort for the outcomes that you want. Um, it's very difficult sometimes when you, you see all these people being completely successful and you're like, but how? If you want to do it, you just need to put in the effort for the outcomes that you want. And that includes taking initiative. Even if you're unable to get to that end goal that you want to achieve, initiative means that you're halfway there. Okay, the next thing that I'd like to just tell everyone is to make sure the company you enter is aligned to your personal goals. 
often we in a job interview we never actually ask our interviewers any questions but you can ask them what what is it like in the company what can they ex what can you expect if you enter the company so you need to make sure that the company you enter is the right fit for you my next piece of advice is to know your five-year goal and keep consistently working towards it. And for many of us, this would be your PR eng. So know what you need for to get a PR eng, and from when you enter the moment in day one, you start working towards your PR eng. Even if it's small little pieces and you're doing bits and pieces, you know where you are going, so it's much easier for you to work towards it. The next point is actually very important for me. I have very bad migraines. So one of the things I really had to learn is to manage my well-being. You really cannot pour from an empty cup. So you need to take care of yourself first before you actually are able to be successful. So take care of yourself and manage your well-being. And the last thing is to just be willing to step out of your comfort zone, be a team player, and be prepared for growth. You really are off to great places. Today really is your day, and your mountain is waiting. So get on your way. Thank you so, so much. And if you have any questions, you can pop them in the chat or ask in the Q&A session. Thanks, Nadira. That was so informative, especially the managing of your well-being that goes hand in hand with your stress management and also your work-life balance. I think that's one of the important lessons I learned as an early graduate. Um, yeah, I hope everyone takes that um, to heart. Up next, we have Erin. Erin graduated from the University of Pretoria in 2018. She's currently a junior civil engineer at Hatch. Erin will be talking to us about the SICE Transport Division. So over to you, Erin. Thanks, Jermaine. Uh, so I think the, the presentations that we've had really led really nicely into um, our presentation. So I just want to confirm, can you see the slides? Yes, we can see it, Erin. Okay, great. Perfect. Yeah, so I uh, come to represent the SIC Transport Division. Uh, I'm the young member there, along with uh, Tsepi, and I head out to the student outreach as well as the uh, young men member portfolio there. Uh, so just a very brief outline, what I'll be going through is basically who are we, uh, our committee, what is our purpose, the awards that we give out, our events, and then our resources. Right. So basically, we're the professional home of traffic and transportation engineers, technicians and technologists. But in saying that, we cover all the disciplines under the transport umbrella. So it's all the way from uh, our policies and our legislators and all of that, all the way through to um, the guys that work on site, as well as our transport planners, geometric engineers, pavement engineers, transport planners, you name it, pretty much we, uh, we will take you under our wing. Um, our goals are obviously to retain, uh, retain and attract more professionals into the industry. We want to enhance our knowledge base and grow technical expertise within the field and obviously remain sensitive to uh, what the demands in the industry are. So I think COVID provided us a, a very good wake-up call in, uh, when looking at the sustainability of our transport system um, and that's just something that you know we obviously look at uh, how we can keep that going. So we do that by looking at four focus areas. So namely it's collaboration, efficiency, diversity, and communication. So with regards to collaboration, uh, we connect with all major industry role players. So obviously SICE National Office and the South African Road Federation, for example, um, as well as SATSI, it's uh, um, all of the, pretty much all of the guys, um, all the way through to the international ones. So ITE, um, Ashto, and all of them. Uh, obviously efficiency, so we want to make sure that our division is uh, well planned and that we run uh, efficiently. And then diversity, so we share our knowledge um, throughout uh, society and uh, we're obviously non-discriminatory and everything else like that. And then our communication is we have our standard communication with regards to the emails from SICE National Office as well as our social media, um, which is both our Facebook and ins uh, yeah, Instagram and LinkedIn. And then we also have our YouTube channel. So looking at our committee, we are made up of 17 people. Um, and at the helm is our chairperson, Frederick Slubbert. 29% of us are female and 59% of us are people of color. And 
we have people from varying uh, backgrounds. So we have uh, people from Sunroll that are either uh, transport planners or we have our geometric engineers. And then we've got uh, also public sector. So the guys um, in ATEC 20, you know, that really plan uh, the whole ATEC 20 network and all of that. So we're incredibly diverse um, and it's a really great group of people. So our purpose uh, is basically the advancement of the traffic and transportation engineering in South Africa. And we obviously align this to the current best practice globally. Uh, so we obviously create knowledge and we build capacity, which is a very big thing, particularly within the public sector. Uh, then we obviously are the voice of the transportation sector and then we're the driving the professional cohesiveness. So that comes back to the collaboration. How do we get private and public sector to work together? So we focus a lot on the why. So that is Simon Sinek's golden circle. Um, and we do this through looking at the various pillars of us. Uh, so we have ethics, which um, a lot of SIC is actually focusing on now. And then we have our awards. And then our three big uh, focus, well, not focus areas, uh, but our pillars uh, are our courses, our mentorship and knowledge management, and then our events. And this basically feeds through all our various portfolios. So that's our student outreach, as well as our marketing, communication and collaboration portfolio, uh, social media communication and our website, as well as our finances or administration, and then eventually into our membership database uh, and then our members. So looking at the awards, uh, we have five awards that we give out annually um, for young people. It's the best paper by a young person at SATSI, which is the South African Transport Conference. And then we also have the best dissertation. So for you to win the SATSI uh, best paper by a young person would mean that you'd have to write an article um, that is obviously current, it has to have suitable data, and you know, you need to really add some knowledge to the industry. Um, and then that will be, you'll be chosen to obviously present that at SATSI, and then it goes into the pool for us to look at it, and then you can possibly win. And then a best dissertation is at a master's level. So we recognize across South Africa, which university student um, at a master's level has written the best dissertation. So our events, we have industry talks and webinars. Uh, so these have focused in the recent past um, on COVID, how it's obviously affected uh, the transport industry and the economy. Uh, also looking at how it's changed travel behavior and how we should try and incorporate that into our plans. Then we also have student webinars, which I'm sure many of you have attended. Uh, we have site visits, luncheons, conferences, uh, master classes, and also our courses. So we have a course that should be coming out in around September, uh, which is back to basics. And that's basically from a graduate level all the way through to our professional engineers, just ensuring that we have the good foundation so we can all be good uh, transport engineers. Uh, so do have a look out for that. Then our resources, so we have our technical resources, webinars and podcasts. Technical resources are uh, all the standards, the legislation, um, and you can go onto our website and it will take you through to Sunroll, to ITE, um, Ausroads, or wherever you want to go and whichever legislation you need to see. Then our webinars I've already addressed. And then podcasts, while they're not ours, we do link you to international counterparts like ITE, who speak about us all different uh, transport related uh, topics. And then finally, if you want to connect with us, uh, you can find us on Facebook at SIC Transportation, uh, as well as on LinkedIn uh, at the SIC Transport Division. We're very active on Facebook and LinkedIn. And then our YouTube channel uh, has all our webinars as well as our student events. And then our home is basically our uh, website, so division website. So you can find all the resources and everything else there. So yeah, that's me and thank you very much. Thanks, Erin. I found that very informative, especially as Priscilla mentioned, you're allowed to join one division as part of your SICE subscription, and I am part of the transport division. Um, so up next, we have Innocentia, is also from another division within SICE. That's the PMCD. 
Um, I must admit, I did have a sneak peek of Innocentia's um, presentation, and she does go through quite a nice introduction of herself. So over to yourself, Innocentia. Thanks, Jermaine. My screen was frozen for a second. Can you can you see my screen? I can see it in Essentia. Okay, perfect. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today about project management and the project management and construction division. I believe the YMP is doing a phenomenal job with sharing information and scheduling such, such sessions. This is something that I, myself as a student or young professional um, started off my career. We didn't have access to such information. Um, so really uh, keep on going and, and, and sharing the knowledge. I, I thought of first in introducing myself. I'm Innocentia Mashangu. I'm a senior civil engineer and project manager. Um, I work for Hatch, which is a global engineering and, and consulting firm. Um, someone challenged me at the start of my career to have as many acronyms behind my name as, as possible. And I've taken on that challenge, um, now pursuing um, a, an MBA. I have about nine years experience in project delivery. I'll share a little bit more about what that means a bit later. And in terms of my involvement with, with SICE, I really started being active um, mid, mid last year. I'm a committee member of PMCD. Um, I'm also the, the champion for diversity and inclusion within SICE. I'm also involved in the education and training um, uh, portfolio as well as the executive board. And I'm quite passionate about mentorship, project management, and the empowerment of women, especially as it pertains to our industry. Um, and I'm also excited uh, for being named as one of 50 rising young leaders by the world's leading uh, project management institute. I enjoy travel, I enjoy hiking, and I also do enjoy my sleep. So you can do all these things and still get some sleep at the end of the day. Um, I only emphasize these points because you can be an engineer in our industry and have a broad range of interests and still be um, a, a project manager. So they're not, they're not really any, any, any limitations um, that, that could stand in your way in, in doing so much in the industry. So why, why would somebody be want to put themselves through project management? So I always find this thing, this picture that I've shared here, um, very humorous. Um, and they even print cups and, and there's even t-shirts made out of this. Um, so to read what it says, it says being a project manager is easy. It's like riding a bike, except the bike is on fire. You're on fire. Everything is on fire and you're in hell. Um, so I, I find it funny. Um, it's, it's not completely that bad. So I hope I haven't terrified you um, at all. Uh, but yeah, so as a project manager, you, you take on a great deal of, of, of responsibility. Um, but as well, it's also quite a, a rewarding career. So in terms of why project management, especially um, for me, I've always wanted to understand the big picture. In, in, in a project. I would struggle at the start of my career if somebody gives me a task to review a drawing or check a drawing, I'd still want to know why. You know, what is the drive behind behind us doing this? And sometimes as a as a junior engineer, you you might be left out of those critical discussions. So I've always fought to try and get myself um, in, 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 into the room of those discussions. And I found that um, one of the best ways to actually uh, have that full understanding of a project from start to finish is by being or playing a role in, in project management. So what project management is, is you essentially responsible for the delivery of the project at the end of the day. Of course, you, wor you, you work closely with an engineering team. It can be multi multiple disciplines. Um, you can work with civil engineers, mechanical engineers, piping engineers, electrical engineers, you, you name all of them. And at the end of the day, um, you have to drive and lead this team to achieve what they, what they set out to achieve. Um, it's, it's quite a challenging role, uh, but again, um, you, you, if you work well with a team, um, you lead your team properly and, and you engage uh, the client continuously throughout the process and a few other things that you can do, um, you, 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 can, you can take 
definitely make it successful. So project management includes uh, about five, five stages, as I've shown on the screen. Um, you initiate your project. You need to understand what is it that you're actually going to be delivering. Uh, plan what, what is your scope, uh, what does your schedule look like, how long and how much, and who's doing what. Um, and, and, and make sure that the project is, is adequately resourced. And throughout the execution phase, then you have to uh, make sure that the work actually gets done. Um, you have to deal with, with queries. If, if there's any issues that need re resolving, um, you need to lead that process as well with the team. And then in terms of monitoring and control, throughout the process, you have to continuously um, evaluate that you are delivering against the, 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 the baselines that you've set or against the scope that you've set. And you need to be able to deal with any changes that may arise. And then at the end of the day, ensure that um, your handover and completion uh, process is, 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 is completed and the client is satisfied with the, with the final product. So that, that for me was really the appeal with, with project management. Uh, the other part I enjoy about it is the variability of the work. Um, I've worked on projects in, 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 in railways. I've worked on in a process plant environment. I've worked in mining. And I just enjoy that variability. And as much as I'm not an expert in everything, but working around, uh, working with experts in, in different projects was certainly um, appealing for me. So those are some of the things that drew me to project management. In terms of how I got to project management, um, I want to emphasize that many of us have uh, different paths to project management. I started working in 2012 after graduating from VETS. And in my first year, um, I realized that my future, I don't, in, in future, I don't want to be a technical specialist. So I made the decision to grow in project management. And within the organization I work in, at least I could um, start fulfilling project management roles as I was getting my technical experience. The one thing that I want to emphasize as well is I, I really focused on being technically competent uh, first before moving completely to project management. Um, I prioritized doing the technical work and then getting my PR eng. And only after I got my PR eng, then I, I decided to, to transition completely now to, to project management. So that was important for me. Um, you can define what's important to you as well. Um, in terms of roles, um, I've worked in a design environment. I've worked on a site environment. I was construction manager on site. I worked in, in project controls as well, playing supporting roles in both project management and, and project controls. And then at this stage now, uh, purely um, into project management. And I don't discriminate on the size or the type of project. Um, and that's really the stage that I personally wanted to get to. But this path is completely different for, for many of us. And some people um, move to project management later on in their lives, like after 20 years. Um, others decide after two years that this is what they want to do. Um, so keep that in mind as you, as, you, as, you, as you go along in your career as well. So in terms of uh, the project management and, and construction division, as I mentioned, I am a, a committee member. So we are we are we look after the interest of project management and and construction within SICE. Um and our our mission is to advance the skill base or the knowledge base of project management and we encourage people to take up careers in project management. Um, our, our our membership is quite big. Uh, it's about three three and a half thousand members and growing. Our committee there's about fifteen of us. And in terms of the portfolio of the committee, we've got a marketing, marketing and communication portfolio, um, providing input to the SIC uh, magazines, sharing articles, and sharing any 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 pertinent inter information that relates to project management and construction. Uh, we do schedule site visits, we do schedule talks and lectures, and then there's some awards as well. I'll talk a bit, a bit about that a bit later. And then other important things within the project management uh, and our, our contractual affairs and dispute resolution. Um, so we do offer courses as well and support in, in, in these areas. And then we also have the young members outreach, which I'm, which I'm also uh, now part of. So in terms of the talks and, and site visits and events, just this year we had um, the, the health and safety uh, lecture 
or, or, or webinar uh, that deals with mitigating COVID-19 challenges on a construction project. We found, given the nature of, of, of the environment we live in now, a lot of our projects um, are impacted by COVID-19 and we want to create an awareness or have have a bit of dialogue around that and the impacts of that um, within our sector. So those are some of the, the events that we've done uh, this year. And in terms of continuous development and, and training, we do offer general conditions of contract courses as well. Um, this term is quite familiar. If you've been in the industry um, for a while, you you especially as a project manager, you need to know your contracts very well. Um, because they they make or break a project, so we do we do um, increase knowledge um, in that sense. And something that I'm excited about, and and which which is coming soon, is the PMCD will also have a fundamentals of project management course, specifically uh, taught, geared at young professionals, especially those that are still starting out, that are still trying to understand the whole um, what project management is about, start, starting to understand to 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 get to understand concepts and so forth. So that that is coming soon um, as well. So please be on the lookout for that. In terms of awards, um, the awards are actually still open, and and we we as the PMCD have the SICE Construction Award for 2021, as well as the SICE Young Constructors Award for 2021. Um, so those that have joined us, especially young professionals that have joined us, um, I'd encourage you to apply to this award. Um, it's still open and it closes on the. 30th of July, um, and the contact details are, are included on the screen. But I, I, I really believe, as, as young professionals, we really put our hands up to to actually go for these awards. Um, and I want to encourage you to do so because um, you you'd be surprised at at how much you have you've actually be, be done. So that'll be great recognition for you as well. And then in terms of getting involved and what you can look out for, um, we are going to be looking for a social media and events committee member um, to help us with our social media presence. Um, but we'll publish this and, and make this open um, once we are looking for that person. And also in getting involved, um, every year there's a call to join committees within within SICE. And, and this is usually circulated on, on different um, the SICE, SICE pages on LinkedIn, social media pages, and so forth. And I'd really encourage you um, to get involved in the industry. It, it really helps you to expand your network. Um, you, 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 and, and, and it does a lot for your career as well, just being active. So I'd really encourage you to, to, to apply whenever you see these, these calls for, for, for joining. So that's me. Um, thank you. Thank you again for inviting me. And I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Innocent, Innocentia. I, I think what you said at the beginning, where someone challenged you to have as many acronyms after your name, I thought that was quite great. Um, I think we should all challenge everyone in this um, meeting to do the exact same. Um, also interesting was that you focused on your PR eng first before moving on to project management. I think that's a lesson everyone can learn as well. Um, up next, we have Jacques Truter who will be talking to us about his XR registration journey. Um, Jacques graduated from the University of Pretoria in 2012. Thereafter, he began working at ESCOM's Arnott Power Station be before moving over to NACO LBE as a senior civil engineer. Jacques recently received his professional registration this year and is also completing his master's degree in project management at the University of Pretoria. Over to yourself, Shark. Thank you very much for that, Yemen. Uh, just a quick test, Yemen. You can see my screen. Yes, we can and hear you clearly. Great. Thank you very much again for that introduction. Um, it's quite an honour for me tonight to share my story with the audience. Um, I thoroughly believe that we will uh, achieve the intent, uh, the intent of the discussion, um, which is which is the extra topic, specifically looking at the formal process the employer and also excess expectation and then implications for registration. Uh, there's been some great uh, presentations tonight, um, extremely motivating, uh, excited me, and, and I thoroughly believe the audience will agree with me on that. Um, therefore, without further ado, let me dive into my detail. So tonight I will be discussing EXA. Uh, most of us have heard the name EXA. Um, but who are they, what do they do, and, and why is this important to us? Well, XR 
as, as some of us know, is the Engineering Council of South Africa. Um, they are a statutory party. EXA has been established in terms of the Engineering Professions Act. This is Act number 46 of 2000. Of course, this act falls under the umbrella of the Council for Built Environment. Um, but we will be discussing that uh, in further detail in a little bit. And then also aligning with the topic of tonight, um, EXA primarily, amongst other features, um, are credited to, to look at programs such as what the students in this audience attend to currently and, and are planning to finish. Um, they credit these programs from the universities and technicons. Also, EXA is responsible to register people as professionals. Um, this is in four categories, of course, engineering, technologists, technicians, and then also certificate or certified engineers. So why is this important to us? Well, there are several benefits associated with registration. Uh, this is for basically for yourself, for your organization, and also for the industry. And, and amongst uh, some of the factors, it involves peer recognition, uh, also public confidence, memberships to some voluntary associations like SICI and the likes, as we've heard through the previous discussions and presentations for not, uh, this evening. Also, marketability, uh, interaction, and also international recognition. Finally, there's some statutory empowerment that comes with EXA registration. And then, obviously, some supreme bragging rights over your friends, which is still in the candidacy period of, of the EXA part. So that said, uh, the purpose of the presentation tonight is to bring some insights into the expectation from EXA. Also to tie some, some critical steps and also some lessons learned to this presentation. I'll be taking you through what I call my readiness guide. So I've developed the triple milestone guideline, which we will use as a basis as a discussion, which is broken into nine fundamental steps, which will in essence take us through the whole EXO journey. And I've done this and I've packaged this in terms of my narrative, my story with EXO. Great, let's dive into the first detail. So this is, this is the difficult part. Um, this is milestone A, which is the first milestone of three. Uh, and it comprises of three steps. This is where you really have to, have to put your head down and, and start with the process. I call this uh, milestone level one, which is the administration level. The first step within this milestone involves the EXA documentation process. So as a first, right from the start of your career, I would employ you to go to the EXO website, study the documents, download all the documents from EXO's website, print them, uh, and a very handy and useful tip is to have a hardcover file at hand and put the documents in your file. What you will see is you will have to read these documents quite a number of times. The first time that you read them, um, it is not necessarily going to make sense and it's not necessarily going to interact with each other. But as you progress through your career, as you discuss this with your mentors, your peers, your supervisors, the puzzle starts to fall into place and also it starts to make more sense. Therefore, it's handy to have a hard copy file at hand. You make notes, also put some sticky notes and flag items into your file. So build this file as you progress through your career. A bit later on, I'll touch on this point again, but I would really employ or and encourage the audience that EXA should be seen, your EXA journey should be seen as a continuous process. Do not leave this for one day when you would, would be ready for, for registration to, to do all this backlog of paperwork and so forth. I think many of us have fallen into that trap. Um, be, be very wary for that trap. Start with the EXA process from day one, build your relationships, build your discussions with your mentor and start to build this document respiratory, this file that you can keep at hand and also reference as you go through these various steps of EXA. Then also what I think is important as part of uh, as the first step and that's also the, the last hint or tip for the first step is to download the application form and also print the application form for the professional registration. So as a first benchmark, you will have to register as a candidate. Uh, this needs to be done as soon as you enter into your career um, with EXA, but also download the professional application form. Why? 
we need to see the goalpost. We need to understand where we want to go with our Excel journey. Therefore, I would employ you to go and to download the application form for the professional registration categories. That inherently will give us a view of what needs to be achieved at the end of the day. Yes, it might feel like quite a far stretch. It might feel that it is unknown and uncharted territory, but that's okay. As we progress through this process, it will become more clear and the path will become much more narrower for us to follow up until the process or the stage where we register as a profession. Then secondly, contextual knowledge. This is a very important topic. Um, this is this is the information that serves as background knowledge, that serves as supporting knowledge to support us throughout our engineering career. This is now professional and also candidacy. And also this will serve to, to help us when we register with EXA to build our presentation and to deliver, deliver a keynote uh, presentation to the EXA panel to showcase to the panel that you understand not only your immediate career function, which might be structural, transport, harbor, or so forth, as discussed earlier tonight, but that you understand the intricacies of the industry as a whole. What is a good starting point? So the discipline-specific guideline for civil engineering will give us a very good starting point for contextual knowledge. There's a whole list of documents, acts, and also uh, statutory bodies, associations, and so forth, organizations that we need to go and study to understand how we do they all fit together in this bigger picture, in this bigger perspective, which is uh, ultimately EXA. These include the uh, CESA, the South African Federation of Engineers, Construction Engineers, CIDB, and the likes. Under the acts, what is important, amongst other acts, uh, we've got the National Water Act and so forth, but I think what, 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 where we can start is the Council for Built Environment. This is Act Number 43 of 2000. This is the umbrella. Underneath this Act, you will find the six professions in the South African context, which involve the architects, the engineers, landscape, also the property evaluators, project and construction managers, and then finally the quantity surveyors. So this, this umbrella, the Built Environment Act, serves as the body, serves as the parent to us as engineers. And we need to understand how all of this fit together, ultimately to comprise of the industry. Finally, another recommendation is, is to go and read the SAC, CMP, and the EXA, which uh, now recently published the identification of your document. It's important to understand where your limits lie, what sort of work you may indulge in, and what sort of work you may also perform. And this again ties back to some of the outcomes of Excel, which they expect you to understand, to showcase, and to discuss and know during your presentation. Um, I found it very helpful uh, in the SACPCMP document, Identification of Work, um, which they give a very, very clear guideline of typical project life cycles. So any organization we've heard from the various speakers, the Transnet, the ESCOMs, the SASOs, uh, and so forth, any organization will have a form of a project life cycle, align with one of those, uh, and use that as a backbone in your presentation to put down the various phases of project that you have uh, been exposed to and working on. Um, as, you, as you take the panel members through your journey where you started off, and where you've been ended off with the project through the entire life cycle. And I found that that document provides us with a very, very good reference uh, to do that. And then finally, under step number two, I found that the SISI article, The World According to SISI, is a very good starting point for contextual knowledge. This will give us the perspective from SISI, all the role players, who SISI interacts with on various levels, not only local, not only the state, but also international. And this provides very good contextual knowledge again, which we can use in our discussion today that we go for a presentation. And not only that, we build into our documentation um, as we progress through this Excel journey. We'll get to documentation in a little bit. And then finally, under level one, which is administration, the first milestone of three for today, 
I put down step number three. This is the submission indexing step. What is the intent here is that from day one, we build a index for our submission document. It ties into the first step where it goes about envision the goal. We need to understand where we need to go and what the goal post will look like. For that, an index is a very good tool. So this will then be basically a breakdown of all the documents that will eventually make up your submission file, which will go then to Excel. And then finally, under step number three, I found it very helpful to use a tracker, which you can put dates to, to, to time yourself, to keep yourself to certain deadlines, and also to put milestones and achievement points down in this tracker, where you want to be at what stage of your journey. Very important, this entire Excel journey is a logic process that you need to plan. And yes, this plan will change. It is an interactive plan. It's a dynamic plan. It will change as we go through this journey. But it's very important to have a plan, and we can amend it as we go along. Key role player for key stakeholders in this plan is obviously your supervisor, mentor, and the likes. Discuss this plan with your supervisor, your mentors, align with them and get the expectations in place. Many organizations do have a formal training plan, although that's not always the case. You might end up a, at the consulting firm or at any other organization for that matter, where the onus will be on yourself to develop a plan which you can follow to build your journey, to date, to highlight, and also to track your journey as you progress through these various stages of, of the EXA process. So this, this is the difficult one. This is the administration part of the XR process. This is the paperwork side of it. Very important to immediately start with this from day one. Do not linger, do not leave it for a better day. Uh, I believe day one would actually be the best for this. Great, then we move over to our second milestone of number three. So this milestone is documentation. This is the sort of boring part to the Excel process. This is really getting into the paperwork, writing down everything, tackling that momentous task of documenting basically your entire journey. Our first step will be DERs. So this is our training and experience reports. Um, there is various requirements dependent on where you are at your candidacy, but most of us will be expected to write DERs. DRs is continuous. We need to write this throughout our whole journey. They may not be interrupted. Um, this needs to capture your, your, your progress, also your experience from day one, from the day you register as a candidate up until the day that you intend to register as a professional. Of course, the TERs have some rules. There's some word limits to the TERs. And there's also some guidelines on how many TERs one needs to write over your period, dependent on how long you are a candidate. Some of the intervention points, this is now when one TER will end and a new TER will start, typically when your work environment has changed, when the type of work that you have been doing changed, so you move from one division to another, when your level of function has changed, perhaps you move from a junior to a more senior position, and also when there has been some interruptions in your training process, that needs to be captured. TRs needs to be developed continuously, as mentioned. It needs to be reviewed and ultimately needs to be signed off by your supervisor or your mentor. File these into your hard copy file as you go along. Do not leave your TRs for one day in future to tend to them. Document the TRs. As you go through the various stages of your candidacy, write down all the, all the topics and mention points on the set format, which is provided by EXA, and file these accordingly. Of course, some hints for the TERs, topics to discuss, is the nature of problems you involve and solve during that period. Also, complex engineering problems encountered and activities that you have managed and the result what manpower was used, what resources, what safety did you encounter, how did you resolve safety issues, how did you tend to safety issues, and the lights contracting, and so forth. Then we move over to step number five. So
So this is now still within the realm of milestone B, which is documentation. And this we call referees. We need to consider that at the point where we are ready for registration, we will have to ask registered people of the same level to be our referees. These are people that need to understand your day-to-day -day operation. They need to know what your work skill and also your experience level comprise of. These need to be people that know you. Therefore, it is highly advisable to ask people in your immediate organization that work with you on a day-to-day -day basis to serve as referees. But this is a formal process. You need to ask them if they are willing to be your referees. Um, a minimum of two, although three is recommended uh, for referees, again, at the same level as, as your uh, registration. So if you are an engineer, then you will have to ask also an engineer, uh, preferably also in your category uh, of engineering, civil, electrical, and, and the likes, mechanical, and so forth. What works well with the referee system is, so you will hand the referee some paperwork they need to fill in. This, this needs to be submitted directly to Excel. Although what we found is that the double envelope system also works in this regard. What is the double envelope system? In essence, you will hand the referees their own envelopes, which they will seal and sign, and this may eventually go into the master envelope file that will be then produced either via delivery or courier or the likes to Excel. And then finally, as mentioned, two or three referees is required, preferably three. Um, make purposeful selections. Select people that know your skill set, that know you as a person, and also can vouch for you to say, you acquired the following skills, expertise, experience, and people that can motivate why you are ready to be registered as a professional person. Step number six of nine involves then the engineering report. This is a fairly big task, although I found, like most things in life, is not to dwell over it, not to be afraid of the engineering report and so forth. I think a good advice I've received with this is just start with it. It will grow, perpetually it will evolve into the report that we will eventually be happy with to submit to Excel. So don't leave this task out of fear to start writing this report. The moment you start, the words will actually start to flow and you will see that this report will come naturally. At that point in time, you will know what you want to say and you will know what you want to put down. Some tips that involve the engineering report. Again, there's also a word count to this. I believe it's 6,000 and there's also some limits on photos and attachments or appendices that you may include. But some tips is to, to utilize two or three projects or maybe one major project that you have been involved in that you have actively worked on not only from exposure level but from a performance level we'll touch on the various levels uh, according, according to excess expectation in a little bit so preferably choose a project that you perform okay then it would be good if this project can showcase all the various project life cycle phases or stages as we go through. These typically involve, again, there's many, many forms of these project life cycles. Every organization will have, their, will have their own. Select a base and stick to that and go with that. So typically that will involve briefing, feasibility, design development, the tender documentation and also construction. That is the procurement side of it mainly. And then the project flows out. So if you can showcase to the EXA panel that you've been involved in all these various phases of the project lifestyle, you understand from inception to close out the requirements, what is needed, what effort level needs to be adhered to, et cetera, et cetera, that will produce a confident report and the panel member assessing it will get the impression that this person understands from cradle to grave what the requirements are in terms of bringing a project up onto its legs. That's some good advice that I can give tonight. Again, 
if you can utilize two or three projects, it will be a good recommendation. There's a lot to write about. Take the reader through the various stages of the life cycles. Explain to them why you are ready to be registered. Sell yourself in this report. This report is a first person report. Therefore, we say, I did this, not we as a group collectively. You need to write about your performance, why you are ready as an engineer or as a technologist or technician to register professionally. Sell yourself. Again, with this, there's, there's various rules on the different categories uh, that need, needs to be adhered to. All of that can be found in step number one, which is the Excel documentation portion of this uh, presentation. Then after we've completed the engineering report, we move to the last milestone, which is milestone C. This is the third one, okay, in our nine-step process. So this one we call presentation. This is the fun part. Now the paperwork has, has been completed. The paperwork is in place. It's ready to be submitted. All signatures have been acquired. All signatures on the documents. Now we start with the submission process. This is process number seven of nine. So you will submit hard copies of all the required documents as per the XR document requirements, which is listed again in step number one to XR. So my advice to this would be to, to acquire a reinforced envelope and to have all of your hard copies in that envelope, which will then be sent to XR via courier, works very well, or drop off or whatever is best suited for your situation. Keep copies of your submission. I think that's that's one of the key points here is at this point we are so excited to submit the documentation we often forget to make backups. Keep copies of all of your documentation. It may get lost in transit and the likes and then you stop. So therefore keep copies of all of your submissions. And then after submission Follow up with EXA, ask for a receipt. Have they received your documentation via email? They will respond swiftly and, and state that they have received your documents and the process will start. Or they will give you feedback to say some documents are missing and therefore you need to produce that in order to get one. So that is step number seven. Moving over to the second last step of the nine step process, the presentation. This is the development of our presentation. My advice to candidates is the day after you've submitted, start with your presentation. Do not leave it for the last moment. It's intense pressure to develop a presentation, practice a presentation within a week's time frame or the like. It will put added on pressure for the day of presenting. Therefore, my advice is always to say, the day that you have submitted, celebrate, be happy, the paperwork, the momentous task has been completed, therefore celebrate that, but the next day, start with your presentation. The presentation will take some time. You will find that your presentation is an iterative process, you will amend your presentation, you will practice your presentation, and you'll change the layout as you go through this, call it evolve stadium. And that's natural. That will happen until you find that natural flow where you can just talk about your presentation from the heart without getting stuck or without having to read anything for that matter, because it will recite in your head and you will talk from, from, from the heart and from experience. So there's also some rules pertaining to the presentation. I've put down a couple of, uh, of those tips here. So keep the slides to a minimum, guys. Um, we only have 15 minutes uh, to present. Uh, they're a bit lenient. They will allow you to go two or three minutes over the time, but they're quite strict on the 15 minutes, 15, 16 minutes, and it goes fast, fast very quickly. So do keep your slides to a minimum. Rather have less slides and talk more keep within the time limit. Then, a very important point with the presentation is to start from the outside and move in. Build context throughout your presentation. Start from an industry level, okay, and end up where you are in that big industry 
bubble or circle. What is your function in the industry? Are you in consulting? Are you in contracting? Are you on the employer side? And the likes. So start wide and work yourself inwards as you progress through your presentation. There's some, there's some set formats, not, not written, um, you know, not prescribed at all, but, but I've seen, uh, most often presentations will sort of follow the same flow. This will typically involve a cover page, introducing yourself, some outline uh, items, items that we will be discussing through your presentation. Then sort of starting with your career, your, um, your experience, your education, and then moving into where you are now, your industry, and then your projects. So they move away from the, the project file to the engineering report or the project report to the engineering report. Um, but most of us do our work through projects, and that's a good way to showcase um, our ability, our experience, and also our skills, our development, um, is to showcase through this project that we have completed. Again, very important is to take to take the, the panel members through your developmental phases. So from an EXA perspective, the various levels start from being exposed, then we move over to assisting on a project or works. Then we participate in works on a project. Then we contribute. And then finally, we perform. We run with it. We, we run with the project. Um, we, we facilitate it. We involved in the designs, the drawings, on site, the verifications, the close out. You know, we've, we've done the entire project life cycle. We performed and we, we, we executed that project with some great level of accuracy and also great engineering judgment and responsibility. That's Exxon's expectation. That's what they want to see through this presentation, through your documentation for that fact, um, is to see how this person has grown in his, in his or her candidacy from, from this person being at an exposure level all the way to a performance level. Again, this needs to tie back to the 11 outcomes. And, and as briefly mentioned during the engineering report uh, process, there's some, there's some regulations and rules that, that applies to the report, uh, a method that you need to write the report and indications you need to put down in the report and so forth. Guys, and then we arrive at the last point uh, in, uh, in our nine step process. And this is the presenting part. This is on the day. This is the day that you sit down with the panel members. These days it's all virtual. Um, it, it, it always was in person. I don't know for the, for the future what it will involve. Um, but my experience, I had a virtual presentation session and it, it was extremely um, fulfilling and also very, very well organized on Excel side. Um, so this is the day that you present to these panel members all of your documentation, that momentous task of, of documenting this three, four, five year journey. You basically squeeze into a 15 minute uh, session where you motivate to the panel that you are ready to be registered professionally. Some pointers here is acknowledge all the communication. So emails will now start to go around. We've received this, uh, we're heading into this process, this is the next steps and so forth from exercise. Do acknowledge that um, and keep uh, keep uh, constant communication with, with the specific EXA um, case personnel that will be assigned to your registration process. Guys, then very important. There's two, there's, uh, there's two processes here for presenting. If EXA is not convinced that you are immediately ready for your professional review, they will first ask you for experience appraisal. So do watch out for the invitation, whether it's for experience appraisal, a EA, or it's for a PR professional review. There's some different requirements pertaining to this. In essence, if you go for experience appraisal and you pass that, then you will also have to go for professional review. But if EXA is confident through your documentation that you are ready, they will like you immediately for professional review. What is key here for me is the five Ps. And this boils down to practice. So proper planning prevents poor performance. Plan, 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 practice, practice, practice. As I mentioned in step number eight, do not wait for the last night 
to quickly develop a presentation, practice it, and then deliver it the next day. This is a stressful time. You need to take into consideration a vast amount of information to communicate to strangers. It is an intimidating process to discuss yourself to these strangers. It's a stressful and also a precious situation. Do not linger. Practice, practice, practice. Plan, plan, plan. This, this is key. In every single discussion I had with my candidacy friends, this was the advice that I gave you. And every single time, following the registration, successful registration, the feedback I got was, practice makes perfect. And that is so true in this case as well, for life also. Again, to master your presentation in one week is an extremely momentous task. It's a pressure time. It's a stressful time. Do not add extra pressure on that, on yourself within that week. Then, on the day when you start to present, be calm, focus on clear and purposeful communication. You've walked this road, if it's three, four, five years, you've walked this road, you've done the hard work. Now it's time to present yourself and sell yourself. Therefore, you do not have to come with elaborate and so forth stories. Be yourself, deliver your experience, your developmental stages to the panel in a calm, assertive, clear, purposeful manner. Exa, focus from your side on designs, the designs that you've been involved in. As engineers, technologists, technicians, we often find ourselves to solve problems, we problem solvers. Guys, we do this via design and analysis functions. So, for Exa, They've got a high focus on designs. And not only designs, alternatives to designs. So I've looked at X, Y, and Z. I've got three alternatives. There's three solutions. But I chose this one in collaboration, in conjunction with the client's feedback, due to economic reasons or whatever the case may be. That's sort of the tone. That's sort of what Exxon wants to get out of this presentation. Then also of, of vital importance is outcome number four and five. This is now management and communication of engineering activities and practices. Okay. Moving over then to outcome number six to ten. Okay, there's eleven outcomes. Exxon needs need to see that you understand risks, you understand ethics, you know when to apply judgment, you know when where does regulatory and statutory requirements fit into the bigger picture and also to act responsibly. This is outcome number six to ten. This you need to showcase through your paperwork, through your discussions, and then ultimately through your presentation. And then finally, outcome number 11, which is the final outcome. We need to showcase why learning is important. Continuous professional development. At that stage as a candidate, it's seen as initial development. But EXA needs to see that you understand it is important like this session tonight, this road show, to share some insights, share some knowledge. Why is learning important for the industry? Why is it important for myself? That sort of that tone needs to come through the presentations as well, uh, whereby we often list courses that we've attended, although it doesn't formally uh, accredit to a, a CPD point. It showcases that you understand why learning and continuous professional development is important for yourself, ultimately. So, industry with various benefits associated with that. Finally, two last pointers on the presentation um, or the presenting side is flashcards work well. Um, if one practice your presentation of flashcards, what you will find is eventually there will be no need to actually use the flashcard. It will be imprinted in memory and you will talk from, from, from the heart uh, when you deliver your presentation. Uh, also, allow sufficient time. Um, I do believe the booking the invitation is, the invitation is two hours for the presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, situate yourself in a calm space, preferably not at work where people can interrupt you, uh, where you can deliver this, uh, this presentation to, to the EXA panel. And there will be Q&A questions after the, after the presentation. 
typically what I've now encountered uh, also through Canada's friends is you're looking about an hour to an hour and a half session, depends on the amount of questions that's been asked that you need to avail yourself for. Right, and then finally, thank you very much for this opportunity again uh, to share my story, my narrative, to take you through the typical steps, the processes, uh, which will involve uh, essentially one day all of us our journey uh, with EXA and and a final tip uh, I've seen this uh, also in industry quite a lot and I've touched on this before is do not leave the EXA process your EXA journey for the last moment uh, this needs to be a continuous process this needs to be a process that you that file needs to be on your table daily where you add notes print new documents and put it in the, in, the, in the file. This is a process that must go continuously as you progress in your career with you up until the day that you are ready, your supervisor, your mentor is confident that you are ready for registration. And I feel this, this uh, quotation is very, very adequate. It doesn't matter how slow you go as long as you don't. Keep that in mind, if you add momentum to this, the benefits will be exponential. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jacques. Um, I thought that was very informative. You spoke on such an important topic because once you gradu graduate, it's one of your first professional targets to meet is that, that professional registration. I know from my personal experience, you mentioned putting together an index and then also a project planner, almost like a Gantt chart with your dates for submission and stuff helped me quite a lot. So thanks, Jacques, for that. Um, we have got some questions through the chat box, but we've also received some questions through the RSVP form that we put through. So we'll go through that first. So the first question we received is, which is better, furthering your studies and gaining more qualifications or gaining work experience? Nadira, are you there? Maybe you want to go for this one? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I think that is quite a weighted question. And I think, honestly, that it depends completely on you and what your preferences are. Both are equally important. Um, I personally chose to go and get a bit of experience because I wanted to make sure that when I did study further, I knew what I wanted to study in exactly. But it really does depend on you and your career path is your own. Um, I think experience is very, very important. And sometimes people do find it a bit easier to actually go in the field and get experience when you're um, qualified, like le slightly less qualified. But at the same time, when you go in with a master's or you go in with a different degree, you have a lot of background knowledge behind you that can actually help you to do your job. So I think really that is dependent on you as a person and whatever works for you at the time. Thanks, Nadira, for your input. Agreed. I, I think it's very a personal decision. I personally struggle to work part time and complete my master's degree. And for that reason, I did full time directly after graduating. So it does come down to being a very personal decision on whether you want to further your education or gain work experience. Um, I think the next question, how to develop leadership skills in the civil engineering field. In Essentia, maybe you want to do this. You are a senior civil engineer. Sure. I, you, you need to start um, taking on tasks in the, uh, irrespective of somebody asking you to do that task. So from the first day you start working, um, you need to see yourself as a leader and volunteer for different tasks and take ownership of delivering that. And then you build that, that up over time. Um, and as you, as you continue having that attitude, people start trusting you a lot more and they start tr trusting you to lead even smaller portions of the work. Um, but you build that up over time. It doesn't happen overnight. And you don't become a, a fully fledged leader from day one. Um, it's really a critical skill that, that, that you'll have to develop the more experience you, grow, you, you get. But I just want to emphasize that it, it really starts with you taking, taking the initiative to, to push yourself. 
Thanks, Innocentia. The next question we received was how to register on SICE as a candidate technician. Um, I think it was, it needs to just be clarified, you will register with EXA as a candidate technician. Um, so that was what, um, well, Jacques went through how we register as a professional registered engineer or technician or technologist. To register as a candidate technician, you will visit the EXA website and there's a form to fill through, fill in with your associated degrees that you need to submit. We will now go on to the question and questions that we received through the chat box. I have made a quick list of them. First of all, the question was asked, will the presentations be shared and will the recording be shared? So currently we are recording the session. Um, it will be sent to the YMP and we'll up, find a way to upload it and share with everyone. With regard to the presentations, I will contact each of the presenters and see if they are okay with their presentations being shared. If they are, uh, we again, we will email that to you guys. The next question we received was, does your academic record matter when job hunting? Uh, I'm not sure who wants to take that, but from my experience, academic record does play some part. It's not 100% of whether they choose you for a job or not, but it does play some part. Um, maybe someone else would like to take on this one. I, I can jump in, Jimin. So there are minimum requirements for, for some organizations which they set based on your academic record. And after you get through the minimum requirements, um, they can hire you having achieved an average of 60 versus somebody that's achieved an average of 80. Um, as you go through the different interview processes, uh, aptitude tests and psych psychological testing, sorry, um, they, no, sorry, psychometric, <laughs> uh, the third time is, is, is the right one. Um, then the, they can select you based on that. You can be a better fit uh, for the company. Um, as somebody that's achieved a, a lower average than somebody that's achieved a, a higher average. So it gets, it gets you in the door. Thanks, Innocentia. But can I just add to that? Maybe perhaps it's just some organizations because some also don't go through that lengthy process of doing all of that psychometric testings and stuff. Um, some organizations just do higher graduates without looking at their academic records. Okay, the next question is, do we automatically become part of SICE young members or, we, or do you have to join? So after graduation, you are a SICE young member. Um, to become part of the SICE young member committee, there'll be a, a there'll be a call for nominations of your, for, from the SICE young members. S similarly to the divisions, there'll be call for nominations to be part of the committee. Um, and once those calls for nominations go out, you can fill those in and submit it and it'll be up to the chairperson and committee to decide. The next question was, does the university you study from matter in finding a job? in terms of university rankings. Um, Nadira, maybe you want to jump in there because we had some, have yeah, had some sure. discussions on that. As far as I can tell you, no, it does not matter in terms of university rankings. Um, all of our universities in SA make sure that their standards are up to the standards that EXA requires. So you do come out with a degree that is definitely, um, or diploma that is applicable and you can enter the industry properly. So no, it does not matter of the university ranking. And we've often found um, just personal experience that a lot of the time different universities place different emphasis on different tasks and where some universities might be very good at the practical, some universities are much better at the theoretical, but that doesn't mean that one would be chosen over the other. So, um, Jimin, I'm sure you can add to that if you'd like to, but I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thanks, Nads. Um, yeah, all universities in South Africa are accredited by EXA, which is then accredited with the Washington Accord for Engineering Degrees. And I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it's the Dublin Accord for 
technologists. So your degree is equivalent wherever you go throughout um, South Africa. And again, your degree is very similar to degrees achieved. I think it's in Australia, New Zealand, the UK and Canada as well. Um, so if you would like some more information on what accredita accreditations you are, you can Google the Washington Accord, Dublin Accord, and I'm sure the Excel website also has more information. The next question we received was, um, in your opinion, which is the best business school in SA? I think this was addressed to you, Maxine. Maybe you want to take it on? Uh, yeah, sure. So it just depends. I think the Gib, I think Gib is the best, uh, but there are others like Henley, and then also it comes down to cost because uh, UCT has a good business school, and so does Wits. But uh, yeah, with MBA and that and going the business route, it really comes down to cost because the Gib, Gib and Henley are much more expensive than say Mancosa and Regent. So you also need to factor that in. Thanks, Maxine. Maybe you can take the next one as well. Is BEng the only step you can take to further your career after completing your diploma? I think I did answer that. So I think uh, if once you've done your diploma, so then you go on to your advanced diploma and then you can get your honors. And then from there, you go the master's route. Thanks, Maxine. Um, the next question is, how does one go about getting a mentor? Um, from my personal experience, it's a lot to do about once you get a job, um, there'll be a senior engineer or senior technologist who will be registered under your commitment and undertaking with EXA to be your mentor. SICE also does provide SICE Connect, which tries to um, connect graduate engineers with senior engineers who are registered as mentors with EXA. And that link was shared in the chat box under SICE Connect. The next question was, how do we get into contact with divisions we have signed up for? Um, I think Erin answered this in the chat box also, if I'm not mistaken, but all divisions do have websites from the SICE website uh, where they have the contact details, details if I'm not mistaken. Erin? Uh, yeah, that's correct. So you can either contact us, uh, there should be a contact us page on the various division websites, or um, you can contact them by commenting on posts or, you know, connecting on LinkedIn and stuff like that. Thanks, Erin. Um, this one was aimed at in Essentia and it asked what is the difference between PMP, PMBOK and PRINCE2. I think in Essentia did answer it in the chat box, but maybe she wants to add on to that. Yeah, sure. So the, the PMP it tests you against how you apply the PMBOK. So it's based on the PMBOK. Um, and what I said in the chat box is as a, as a civil engineer, I'd encourage that you do the, the PMP. Uh, versus the Prince 2 because it's more aligned to to how we deliver projects. Thanks, Innocentia. Um, and the last question, a few questions we received is, what is SICE doing in terms of unemployed graduates? Um, so I did also share a link on the chat box about SICE Young Members Job Hunting How to Guide. This is just one of the things SICE is doing to assist unemployed members. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you can also go to the SICE website um, and SICE Connect. There are countless ways that we're trying to assist. Um, but again, I think everyone will be best suited if they just go to the SICE website. That was the last, let me just check the chat box one more time. Um, Sorry, there's one more question for Jacques. If you go into the direction of academia, um, becoming a researcher or lecturer perhaps, would exit journey differ as for someone going directly into industry?
Jacques, are you there? Yes, yeah, man. Sorry, I was just waiting you for you there for Q. Um, so I have seen this. Um, uh, so, okay. The XO requirements um, basically boils down to the 11 outcomes which you need to showcase. Um, however journey you decide to take on, whether it's in industry as a consultant, contracting uh, on the construction side or on the employer side, and also obviously then on uh, being a researcher or working for, for academia as a, as a lecturer and so forth. So I've seen this um, previously. I think one will have to come with some good initiatives uh, if you are full time in the academia um, to satisfy all 11 outcomes. Uh, it is definitely possible. I've seen this being done with various people. Um, and, and primarily this will then, in my opinion, be fulfilled via external to the academia um, exercises where you then uh, also in, are involved in designs, analysis, and, and the likes. Um, but it, it, it might be a bit of a more challenge than someone directly into entering into the industry. Thanks, Jacques. I hope that answered everyone's questions. Um, lastly, I just want to say thank you to everyone that was involved in setting up the presentation. To the SICE young members, Tebo, Frida, um, Maxine, thanks guys for assisting in the planning. To our speakers, in essentia, uh, Jacques, uh, Maxine, and Nadira, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules um, to present today. And then lastly, thank you to the UJ Civils student chapter for setting up the Blackboard, setting up our RSVP system. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Be safe, take care, and keep warm. Cheers.